Hollywood. That's how Citizen Kane was born. Citizen Kane, most film critics and historians agree, and I agree with them, one of the two greatest films ever made. To explode a few myths, Citizen Kane did make money, even though the Hearst Press did everything it could to stop the film. And Citizen Kane, Goodbye Myth Number 2, was recognized when it opened as a great film. It won the New York Film Critics Award, was nominated for an Oscar. Hearst had enough power to keep it from winning. Wells was 24 years old when he made Citizen Kane. He said when he saw the RKO studio, I feel like a kid who's been given the world's biggest set of electric trains. Never before had picture, sound, story, performance been used the way Wells used them in Citizen Kane. Camera angles, overlapping dialogue, a profound script, powerful ensemble acting. Wells poo-poos a Citizen Kane. He says, everything I did had been done before, and that's true, but people had built houses before they built the Empire State Building. And Citizen Kane is a skyscraper of a movie. The other great film, Grand Illusion, a French film by Jean Renoir, the painter's son. I've heard Orson Welles call it the finest film he had ever seen, but Jean Renoir taught at UCLA when I was there. I heard him say Citizen Kane was the finest film he had ever seen. I agree with Renoir. David? immortal words, the story of newspaper tycoon Charles Foster Kane begins. Last week, Ruth Warwick, who played Kane's first wife in the movie Citizen Kane, and Paul Stewart, who played Kane's valet, uh, joined us from our studios in Los Angeles, along with the director, producer, co-writer, and star of Citizen Kane, Orson Welles. You had this <laughs> tremendously successful theater and radio company, the Mercury uh, group in New York, and then you go for the first time to California, and I understand you got a contract that gave you control as co-writer, as uh, uh, as producer, as star, and you had more control than perhaps anybody had ever had, and you were only 24. How did you get that kind of control? Sheer ignorance. <laughs> I didn't want to go to movies all that much, and I kept raising the ante because I was very happy where I was in the theater and the radio and uh, I asked for the impossible and that's the way to get it in Hollywood. The, the Hollywood press was skeptical. I understand the bosses of RKO were skeptical and yet you faked them out, right? With starting the picture early and they didn't know Yes, it. well we made 20 days of what we called tests saying that I didn't know how to direct so I was going to make these tests and find out and really we were shooting the picture. You'd shot 20 days yes, and they that's didn't right. know it. I had indeed faked them out. And we also used to tease them because I don't play softball, but I organized a softball team, remember? Yeah, right. And whenever we heard that the head of the studio was going to visit us, we'd all come out of the set and be playing softball when he arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there was so one... think we were doing nothing. Ruth and Paul, what about that? Were you all skeptical and uh, uh, at, oh, at first of Orson? Good heavens, no. He doesn't mean... Mercury Theater players. He means the other actors in Hollywood. We adored him. We were a family. They had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we uh, we didn't consider ourselves uh, acting in the movie. We were acting in, in, in the place where you were directing us and putting something together that eventually turned out to be a movie. We were not conscious of the camera. He said to me, I'm ready to do the film now. There's one key role. It's not, it's not big, but it's very important. The niece of the president, and um, she has to be a lady. And there are no ladies in Hollywood. <laughs> I no, he never said that. He did. Well, he said, I haven't I don't been mean, to Hollywood. <laughs> he said, I don't mean somebody who can play a lady. I mean somebody who is a lady. The scene, the breakfast scene, where, you know, you argued about the marriage breaking up and so forth. How do you remember that scene? Well, uh, I, it, I think it's probably been shown more than any piece of film in history, right? because every student that is, uh, you know, wants true, to be in films or wants to do me. films sees it. I absolutely adore you. Oh, Charles, even newspaper men have to sleep. I'll call Mr. Bernstein, have him put off my appointments until noon. What time is it? Oh, I don't know, it's late. It's early. I was a little frightened of it because I knew how important it was. I knew it was key and it had to go through the whole history of their relationship, the whole history of his uh, changing. And uh, he directed me a lot in everything else, but he didn't direct me in this very much. 
I wanted Emily to be the same all through the years of the marriage. And I wanted to be different because I was the one who was turning into a monster. That's why I left her alone and didn't direct her because I wanted her to go on playing it on the note which she had established in the first cut. Because as you remember, it goes, it's one breakfast scene that takes 12 years to, to eat. People will think what I tell them to think. You know Alan Ladd was in Citizen Kane? Yes, you know, yes. Nobody knows that. That's right. It was his first movie. He played he, the leading, the leading the uh, reporter in the big crowd of black silhouettes but that he's go got through the, the place. He's got the pipe. And he's got the pipe and he's got the Alan Ladd hat. You can make it out. Near the end of the movie, Paul, uh, there's a scene before Kane is dying and says the word rosebud, uh, which refers to the sled. Tell us what you remember about that scene. Orson, Orson said to me, we were rehearsing the sequence where I say, Rosebud, I'll tell you about Rosebud, how much is it worth to you? Rosebud? i tell you about Rosebud. How much is it worth to you? We'd rehearsed it a long time, and, and then Orson said, let's try one. The stage got quiet, and he said, just before he said, roll him, he said, you're, you're going to be this big on the Radio City Music Hall screen. And then quietly said to me, good luck. <laughs> and then he said action, and I was so touched and surprised about the size I was going to be, I forgot the line. Wait a minute, that is, <laughs> wait a minute, that I, is the director I, that you're both saying is this legend that you love well, to you work know why with? I said it? It? You know why I said it? Why? Because it was his first shot. That's right. And he, I wanted to be sure he didn't do too much with his face. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a way of telling him not to, 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 not, not to be... Uh, Don't overdo too, it. Yeah, that was the that was the night actually that I speak of when Orson said let's go over to to, to RKO. Uh, we had only two or three sleds, uh, and uh, it was a very difficult shot in which uh, the camera had to go in very fast and, and catch the rosebud actually uh, burning, burning. You see, and uh, it was a very very uh, the shot had to be timed to the second, and uh, we were running out of sleds uh, <laughs> because the rosebud would burn up. And they probably would try to retrieve it from the, from the furnace. But suddenly the doors of the stage burst open, and the hordes of men came in in rubber coats and big helmets and everything. And they, we had, caught, we had uh, caught the roof on fire because they had just put in a temporary flue for the furnace. And uh, uh, he's, one of the firemen said to me, what's going on? And I said, we're making a picture. He says, who's that? Pointing to Wells. And I said, that's Mr. Wells. He says, well, it figures. <laughs> because in a reference that goes back 40 odd years but we had just done the war of the worlds as we've heard from from paul and from ruth and from millions of others they talk about you as the genius movie maker there have only been a few geniuses in the last three centuries and i'm certainly not one of them well on, and, the, uh, on the other hand Orson, there are other people who who are disappointed that following that and certain other pieces of work they, they criticize you and say you never lived up to the expectation and you didn't follow up Citizen Kane as you might have or could have, and they, they ripped well, I Well, made, I've made better pictures than Kane. Which? Since then. Chimes at Midnight is the best picture I've made, and uh, I don't think it's the greatest thing ever known, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a more mature picture. Uh, uh, the people who criticize me for not living up to Kane uh, should read the contracts of every picture I've made since then, I was never given as much power, and uh, that's my alibi. I'd love. I wish he. I wish. I wish he had. I'd like to see him make a, one movie and have all control and see what would happen. It'd be great. Anyway, Orson Welles, uh, Ruth Warwick, and Paul Stewart. Thank you. And yesterday, you know, with uh, Gone with the Wind, Butterfly McQueen, McQueen was. We ran out of time, so we didn't get to talk to her. So tomorrow, I mean, coming up next week or the week after, with Butterfly McQueen.